Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to Josh Roberts. Born and raised in South Africa, the extensive travels of Josh Roberts include ventures deep into the state of mind called Bipolar Type 1. Josh combines his lived experience in the mental health system with his education in psychology from the University of South Africa, as well as theology with a master's from Fuller Theological Seminary. His passion is to create a synergy between the inner and outer worlds through optimizing mental health. He works with prominent mental health providers in San Diego, California, including NAMI, Mental Health Systems, and Interfaith in supporting many of those who are affected by mental health struggles. He's an avid surfer, riding the currents of the American lucid dream with his wife and two young daughters. Now, before we start, I should point out that while Josh works for a number of prominent mental health providers in San Diego, he's not talking on behalf of any of them today, but is speaking from his own lived experience, which he uses to provide support for those who are most affected. Josh, thanks for coming. Sean Blackwell, my brother. This makes me very happy. Thanks so much for having me here and for your work. Bro. Your work was actually the thing that kind of catapulted me in this direction. So appreciate you, bro. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks a lot. And, you know, how I found out about you, I'm doing an interview with Chris Cole, and he tells me that there's this guy from NAMI talking about my work. And I'm like, someone at NAMI is talking about my work? That's impossible because NAMI's just got this big reputation as being this very conservative organization. So I got curious about meeting you. Um, so great to have you here. And maybe we just start at the beginning. How did you get into the alternative psychiatry, alternative to psychiatry scene? Obviously, you must have had some non-ordinary experiences yourself. Absolutely. Well, you were kind of the one who got me into it, but it started with the experiences. And it's interesting because uh, as I was traveling around the world, I had two of these experiences, little peeks down Alice's rabbit hole before taking my final plummet. And the first one, my brother helped me navigate. He was so like kind of accepting man and guiding that I came out of it. The second one was in Cape Town, South Africa. And actually one of my best friends descends from the Khoisan Bushman. And him and his buddies kind of took me in and helped me navigate that. And I came out of that. And then the last one uh, was in San Francisco. Um, actually, no, sorry, it was in the mountains of Crestline in San Bernardino. And I didn't have any of that kind of support system. So I fell deep down Alice's rabbit hole and smack dab into the American psychiatric system. And it didn't work for me. Kind of the labels that they were throwing at me, they were telling me, oh, you have a lifelong disability. You may want to lower your expectations about what you can achieve in life. It was a heavy blow, man. It set me into a, a deep depression until I discovered you. But really, <laughs> yours was one of the, <laughs> it's you, dude. Yours was one of the first narratives. I was like, yes, wait a minute. If he experienced this and I experienced this, this can't be my brain misfiring randomly. And so then from then on, <laughs> I, I wrote every single paper in my master's degree in seminary on this kind of stuff. And I found there's so much backing to it. And I ran it by some pretty reputable professors um, and, and they kind of endorsed it too. So you're onto some stuff here. And it's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Wow. Well, let me slow you down a little bit here because you just gave us enough to talk about for an entire interview already. Uh, and just one little aside, what happened to you, that was my strategy online. I was thinking that people, when they go to psychiatry, they're told that what's happening to them is like chaos. And, and that's why they have a broken brain. And I was like, well, if I explain to people exactly what's going on in their so-called acute psychosis and and i'm relaying to them the experiences that they're having then they'll know that there's a meaning behind this because it's not chaos everybody's having the same basically the same 13 experiences you know it's all all sort of there you know but i'm really curious about uh your first episode you were supported by your brother how did that come about and why was he so supportive because he's a legend man <laughs> shout out to brandon <laughs> yeah no you know he inherited the same yo 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 <laughs> yeah he, he really is a legend and we inherited the same genetic predispositions and so i believe that these are stories that are being transcended uh, passed on to us from the previous generations and so he kind of gets it um that's for one thing plus south africa is very eclectic we were raised in the country with 11 official languages that draws on all these deep spiritual traditions so he was 
more kind of open-minded with that sort of thing. And he knows me so well. You know, that's the power of the peer support movement. You get to know people really well and you get to know their experience because you've kind of tasted of it. And mm-hmm. so it, it was started by weed. Like I started smoking weed when I was 16 and right. initially I just got the munchies and just, you know, did the typical things. But I started changing the way that I saw it using it. Wait, what is it doing to my psyche? And I would look inside myself. Wait, what's it doing to the spiritual world? And is there any kind of change there? And once I started to think like that, boom, it sent me down the rabbit hole. And my brother was there to kind of help me clamber back up. And what I realized was, dude, all the stuff that I learned in Catholic catechism that I thought was completely irrelevant, it's all true, bro, which makes life ridiculously <laughs> interesting and magical. And so... That really helped. Um, but yeah, and then I fell a kind of deeper another time. He was there for me then too, but the system got, the psychiatric system got a hold of me. And just to and, quickly say, I'm not anti the system. I, I, I dig the system. We just need a complementary perspective. Right. And so was this first episode you had, would you describe it as a little bit mild? Do you think you went into a full-blown psychosis or, you know, the, the, like, did you get so delusional you thought you died or, or something like that in the first uh, experience? so delusional that i thought i died well well I I don't, that's <laughs> no, a different way to mean. put it um yeah did you really lose touch with reality to the point where normal people would end up in the psychiatric hospital absolutely and um, yeah i just did the quotation marks thing because i believe you're onto something man i think they say delusions uh-huh. misaligned with reality oh well who's reality mutual consensus reality we know that <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I'm just validating the whole, I think I died thing. That happened to me in Cape Town, actually. But the first time I didn't yeah. think I died, but I would definitely have been hospitalized because my ideas um, were so misaligned with mutual consensus reality. So for instance, I was getting these high dimensional downloads, which were increasing in bandwidth. The more I explored it, um, I knew when my phone was going to ring and who was calling, when the birds were going to fly past. I could look deep into my brother's eyes and see into his soul. Um, and so if you go around telling people all this, and I was kind of loud and rambunctious. So if you do that on the streets of La Jolla or something, you might be taking a little trip to, to the white walls or something, but it, it worked out at that time. Once the weed wore off, I came back out. Um, that wasn't always the case. Okay. So he sort of knew where you were going. It wasn't the full blown. It doesn't sound like the full blown acute psychosis kind of thing. And I'm struggling with the language because, you know, I don't mean psychosis we'll say full-blown spiritual emergency right it wasn't it wasn't to the point where you were getting yourself in deep trouble you were just annoying people that's usually associated with a sort of a bipolar 2 diagnosis you were kind of just annoying people but but your brother knew what you were going through he had that he and he knew you were smoking weed getting in touch with that spiritual dimension so he just decided to ride with it to a certain degree Exactly. And that really helped and the closeness that we had. And, you know, I think that depending on how far you explore that, if I had then taken to the streets of San Francisco and wandered around, if you keep exploring it, I think it it can go as deep as you allow it it to go. And to the extent you have the maps that allow you to navigate it well, it could either lead to, I don't know, little glimpses into the nature of reality, or it could lead to some dangerous situations. Um, So at that point, it kind of closed off. Uh, but I think I could have well explored that deeper and gone into a full-blown so-called psychosis. Okay. All right. So that's how it started. And then, okay. So then your next episode is a little bit more intense. Then you get into the psychiatric hospital in San Francisco and you're like, dude, this is not my beach. <laughs> and, and And where does it go from there? So once I came out the hospital, I was given the medication, um, which kind of served a purpose for a while. It kind of brought me down until I was like, wait, was that real? Until it started burgeoning through that. I was like, oh, it is real. And these weird synchronicities start happening. And I think, no, no, there's something there. And as is typical, I messed that up (laughs) and I I got off the meds too quick, ended up getting hospitalized again. Um, so I actually, overall I was 51 50 or taken to a psychiatric hospital against my will six times and was arrested twice. So I made a lot of mistakes, man. And you know, it's kind of understandable given that no one understands how this stuff works. And we're certainly not taught it in, in middle school or high school. And so that's why it's my passion now to try to build maps that can allow people to navigate it better. Wow. Uh, and you're, you're, you're off medication now, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. For years, it's, I've been off the meds. How long has it been? 
uh, five years. Like, I think I got wow. off in 2017. And not to say that everyone should get off or that it's not for everyone. Um, as I said, they could be a tool. I feel like they help us to gravitate at the right height or they can allow us to swim in this water, Joseph Campbell's water. Um, and they can be water wings that allow us to float. And then once we learn to swim, we can reduce them. But for some of my buddies, they're like enhancing neurocognitive technology and they can serve them well for the rest of their life too. Okay, yeah. And so you said you you were inspired by my work and then you started writing in your, you're doing your master's degree at Fuller? Exactly. Uh, and why were you in theology? Psychology, a lot of people do. Theology, master's in theology is a pretty rare bird, <laughs> especially you for a like surfer. You a rare bird. I like to be a rare bird surfer. Uh, my profile yeah. picture on Facebook is Jesus as a surfer. I think Jesus would be a sick surfer. He's probably the best. And I want to ride the currents like he did. Yeah, man, it was really um, that first experience in San Francisco that showed me, wait a minute, all the stuff that we kind of just took as mythology, or maybe I should believe it, and but didn't really believe it. I realized it's all true. And the Bible, that kind of modality gave me the most solid map. I mean, I guess it's kind of similar to Rick Strassman in his DMT studies, it starts off as a kind of reductionist materialist. As soon as he discovers these domains, his latest book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, actually comes up with the Hebrew Bible as the richest framework to navigate these things, basically the Old Testament of the Bible. So I found the same thing. I found that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, in fact, I do believe that Jesus went through some of these navigations himself, but navigated it well. Um, so, you know, and I was surprised how receptive the professors were, how receptive the students were. It was, it was like a magical Hogwarts place full of seminary. It was amazing, man. And so it, now I was like, what am I going to do with a theology degree? But it transformed my lenses. And when you transform the way you see the world, everything you see changes. So I'm, I'm stoked that I did it. Wow. I get the impression that people who are studying theology usually become priests or ministers or something. Is that a misconception? No, I would say a good 80% of the people who I went there with do do that. Um, I just struggle to fit in any kind of boxes. Maybe I'm just a rebel at heart and I rebel against boxes. Um, so I, I couldn't really fit inside the, the walls of dogma, just like I couldn't really fit inside four walls as a therapist. Um, but this kind of a thing, exploring the frontiers of consciousness, it aligns both. It, like, it aligns the world of psychology and spirituality. Wow. There, there's just a movie there, you know, surfer goes to theology school. That's a movie, you know? <laughs> That'd be so sick, right? Like the first day that I got there, I was at this like kind of gathering with the students. We went out for little sliders and I was telling the one girl my story and she's like, I'm so glad I came to this seminary because this guy smokes weed and discovers Jesus. And, and this is where he comes. So I smoked weed and discovered Jesus, bro. <laughs> Oh, oh, right. By the way, I'm not endorsing weed. Um, no, you are endorsing weed. I'm not endorsing weed. I'm not endorsing weed at all because it's the biggest trigger for people to contact me with, with manias, you know, and the episodes and that. And it's paradoxical for me, you know, because I know these things have a great potential for healing and, and awakening, and that's what happened to me. But at the same time, when usually when people go through the drug-induced way, it seems to be more difficult. You know, they, they, they don't make it through the way it happens to people who say get there when they're meditating 10 hours a day and then they have their opening. It seems to be easier to navigate when you get there through mystic experiences or just by accident, like what happened. So right, Sean. You know? Yeah, it's almost like um, you're strapped to the rocket ship using substances and you kind of get the perspective, but you have no control. Whereas if you can learn to steer the rocket ship, which requires learning physics, which is yeah. a mission, um, then you're steering a rocket ship. So I've found the same thing. Steering the rocket ship is a great thing for us to talk about, but I think that's about 20 minutes or maybe an hour into our conversation. So I want to go back. Okay. So you did the theology thing. You're doing all your master's degrees and then uh, you're hooked on the sort of alternative perspective. And that's cool. I mean, I meet all kinds of people who love my work and, and lots of people who embrace an alternative perspective. I've never met anyone who's done a damn thing even close to being involved with NAMI and having them be supportive. So how did that come about? Oh, man, uh, this is kind of the approach that I take to life in general. Um, when I'm going to go through something, I want to work in that field so that I understand it. So like when I found out I was going to have my first daughter, I went and got a job as um, a child and parent coach so that I could learn kind of psychology. And when I went through 
my deep depression and I was being told all these things about my bipolar, I was like, that's it, bro. I'm going to, I'm going to work for the, the biggest name in the field. So I just Googled NAMI. They happen to have a vacancy in San Diego. I follow the synchronicities. Uh, and I mean, at the time I believed, and I was still like kind of accessing a little bit of the mania, a little bit of depression, a bit of the mixed state. I believe this was like a version of the CIA. I was being recruited for like the best of the best. Um, and so I took it really seriously. And, and, and it was really interesting because I got a, a lot of experience real quick. I worked for a program called IHOT North, the in-home outreach team. And so we would serve treatment-resistant people in the communities, in the jails, on the streets, uh, in the psychiatric hospitals. And so if you wanted treatment and you call IHOT, they're like, oh, sorry, there's other places for you. We were the ones who people didn't want treatment. So I had to really learn the nuances of the field and also kind of how the field interconnects um, because it's a complicated system. But weren't you treatment resistant too? Depends on what kind of treatment, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like a fox, a fox in the in hen the house. Head. Maybe it's a fox in the <laughs> hen house and chowing some eggs. But it was it was nourishing and a field and adventure. I was resistant to things that um, shut me down, that took away my meaning and purpose. Like, I mean, Viktor Frankl says that a person dies without a purpose. We need meaning and purpose in our life. So I found NAMI embraced that. And they were so cool from the beginning. Like never did they shut me down. They actually wanted to hear the voice of the peers. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, maybe that's not the case around the country. I actually didn't know that that NAMI had that kind of position in San Diego. Very open-minded. Um, and they were so cool really? from the beginning. Like I could say nothing bad about them. And I think sometimes, you know, people know this stuff is real, but they're not quite sure how to bring up in context, like professional organizations and stuff. So pretty soon in to working there, like I went into the office and I told one of the, the ladies there, the quote by Joseph Campbell, the person in psychosis is drowning in the same water that the mystic swims with delight. And she was like, oh, that's good. I come back sure. a couple of weeks later and she's got a poster on her wall of that quote. And so it's like, she gets it, but maybe you, maybe we believe that we can't um, be ourselves within professional organizations. But what I dig about NAMI is they hear the voice of the peers I work for, a program mm. called In Our Own Voice. It's like they want to hear our voices. And so, man, maybe maybe San Diego is the pioneer. Maybe the, the rest of NAMI, if, if, if you're listening, NAMI, uh, come on now. Um, maybe San Diego can kind of set the precedent. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. And, you know, I had the experience, um, of course, the stereotype of psychiatrists is they just think everything's a chemical imbalance and they don't listen and they just medicate you for life. And And I know that's what most people go through, but not all psychiatrists are like that. I've met some psychiatrists who've been really open-minded, met some, uh, one holotropic breathwork facilitator who is a psychiatrist, actually two that are like three psychiatrists that are a holotropic breathwork facilitators. If you can believe that. Yeah. Thinking about it, all very cool guys, you know, and they got to work in those both worlds at the same time, which is not an easy thing to yeah, do. It's true. Yeah. They're trying to straddle two paradigms. But yeah. you, you, you can straddle, as long as you understand the one paradigm really well, um, you can introduce new models that actually align with it. I don't think they need to be in competition. Like, I mean, that's just human duality. Science is competing with religion. Wait, why? But psychiatry is competing with the spiritual emergency. Wait, why? Bro? They're just two different angles of seeing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's how I see it completely, you know, and... In the beginning, I was pretty anti-psychiatry. My first taste into this world, uh, along with Stan Groff's work, was related to Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and, and the Mad in America movement on, on, in their online site. And even though Robert Whitaker's not like that, there's a lot of people there that are very anti-psychiatry. I mean, it's just really hostile. But after some years, and I was a little bit like that too, but after some years, I realized that Hey, you know, some people need their meds to function, to hang on to their families, to hold their jobs. And unless a better alternative comes along, that's the best they're going to be able to do. I think you're so right. Yeah. Um, I think it's human hearts are trying to do the best they can. And like the psychiatrists and the people in the field, the vast majority have these big hearts. They're just kind of taking the knowledge that they were handed to them and doing the best with it. Like, where is the alternative instruction? If we really want to impact the system, we've got to reframe education. It needs to start really young, um, but especially um, in the mental health professionals. And so I, I, I believe that they're trying the best that they can. I could understand also why the anti-psychiatry movement has been hurt of medications and that whole system can be dangerous. Um, and so there'll be those defenses. 
But I just think that those put up walls. We should be trying to build bridges and not barriers. Um, and I think the human heart can can transcend all of that. Mm-hmm. And meeting people like you, I feel like I'm meeting more of my yes, tribe, to tell you the truth. Because I think that there needs to be, to do something constructive, there needs to be an inherently positive energy around the whole thing. And if if you're going to be negative and attacking and protesting and that 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 kind of energy it's not constructive and it just puts the other the enemy into an enemy camp and they get defensive and and there's no communication you know there's no communication maybe there's it's got its purpose but at some point you've got to get constructive about yeah, the whole so, thing yeah. you know and i just to, just to add you know i went to a psychiatric nursing conference in riga latvia uh some years ago gave a presentation on my work and that night, that they were just all over me. They just loved my presentation. They thought it was great. I had this Finnish guy who organized my room, and he just came over, put his arm around me, and he said, Sean, <laughs> motherfucker. It was the greatest compliment I've ever received, you know. It's beautiful. In Latvia, of all places. In Latvia, of all places. I went to that conference basically just for the story to say, yes, I went to a psychiatric conference in Riga, Latvia, because that was just, it says enough, you know? <laughs> but so you you found them immediately receptive when you went in. I earned their trust. I mean, I didn't yeah. come at them. In fact, I didn't know all this stuff. I was just discovering it. Um, so I didn't come at them. Hey, da, 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 da. I, I just, uh-huh. like, you know, did the best job that I could and built their trust and did a bunch of projects for them and, and earned that. It's relationship. It's the human hearts thing. It's like, no wonder the, the Latvians... It, were receptive to you because there was that connection of the heart regardless of geography. So um, I built their trust and slowly but surely they realized I could kind of navigate it. So maybe there was something of value and now they're like actively endorsing it, which is such a blessing, man. How did they find out about that? Like, well, first, how did you navigate? How did you get through, you know, you were hospitalized right. six times. How did you get through? How do we walk? We just, it's it, walking is a series of coordinated falls. Oh, and then you catch yourself and then you catch yourself and then you catch yourself. So I guess I just learned to fall and coordinate myself on the falls. But really uh, cutting out weed was a big deal, man, because one hit of weed would send me straight down the rabbit hole. And I was like, yeah, but that's my, my source of insight and mystical truth and all that kind of stuff. Until I realized, wait a minute, the 12 step programs are all about inducing a spiritual experience. The 12 step as a result of the spiritual awakening, we take this message to others. So there is a way to access the sober and kind of control the rocket ship. So cutting out weed was a big deal. Um, learning the tools, right? I mean, and I was working in the field. So every day, that's another thing, like working in something that you're passionate about, that you really care about, having a meaning and purpose to what you're doing makes you just absorb more of it. And so I was, you know, learning from kind of the best of the best and just watching with a keen eye. And as a sponge, I was absorbing all the tools that work for people. And just with practice, you know, I got better. I, I don't have it all figured out for sure, man. I still make a bunch of mistakes, but that's where I think our community, we can kind of fill in each other's gaps. Um, and that's why we're better together. So discovering stuff like this and, and to your audience, um, I think it's beautiful that we all exist. And with the internet, with the interconnection that's possible now, oh, the, these are new frontiers, man. Yeah, yeah. It's a new frontier every few is. months, right? I mean, even this whole platform that we're doing this on, it's just been around for the last year or so. and. I, I never wanted to do interviews because I could never get the quality in a, in, a, in a video format that I wanted. And then when I found this, it was like, okay, this is, this is what I've been looking for. Um, but you said a couple of things. You, you know, you went off the weed, you just stopped. Smoking, yeah, I did. Uh... Period, right? And um, and no other psychedelics or mushrooms. No, I've never actually like done that. any other psychedelics besides weed because I believe um, kind of pe- people are – who are neurodiverse or neurodivergent, we kind of gravitate towards that realm naturally. Maybe we have a biochemical predisposition. And so just one hit of weed would send me into a very similar space to what mushrooms or LSD, sometimes even DMT would send people into. But I got such a fascination for the topic and I wrote a bunch of my papers at Fuller on this um, because it's a psychedelic renaissance. And plus it's like a similar dimension to what the spiritual masters accessed and psychedelics were originally called psychotomimetics because they mimic psychosis so closely. So I have a deep fascination in, in the topic, oh. um, but I'm very cautious because I don't like to be strapped in the rocket ships. 
Yeah, for sure. And I've I've met a number of people online who, if they just stop doing drugs and smoking weed, funny enough, social alcohol doesn't seem to be a problem, although heavy alcoholism can, can cause psychosis. But the main thing is that if they just stop smoking weed, they can bounce back and not have any more episodes. I've met other people in that situation as well. So that that's something I'm familiar with. Uh, and then, so you're in the mix and you're working with what they call treatment resistant um, folks. And, and how did that shift your perspective on things? Oh, absolutely. Because what I get paid to do all day, it's so beautiful, man. Like I got paid to just cruise amongst the most interesting people in the world, I believe, and just hear their perspective and like hear from them. See, now I'm very receptive because I'm trying to figure this out. And time and time again, I hear the same story, the same kind of narrative. Um, that you, you express on your channels coming through. And I'm like, well, there's obviously something here. So I, I explored it. Um, it led me to realize, actually, this is kind of prominent in San Diego County. It's pretty pioneering county. Well, I love it. I, Cape Town, South Africa, and San Diego, California, man. Uh, I think about as good as it gets. Good fit and just wonderful places. And here in San Diego, they've got, for instance, the county sponsors a training um, that trains faith leaders in psychology and mental health professionals in faith. So they're trying to integrate the two. Right. Yeah. So I found actually there were more opportunities than I, I thought initially, and maybe there are everywhere else as well, but it kind of lies below the surface. So I discovered both the system um, opportunities that were there, as well as the deep resonance and the narratives and the stories that I was hearing from my peers. And the fact that I got it and connected with them on that level, they I got the nickname at IHOP, the peer whisperer, because they, you know, we're on a frequency, bro. And me and you, we're on a frequency. I'm not trying to get you to do anything. Um, and so I, I felt that it really informed my perspective and maybe realized we're onto something here, dude. Were you working with like the people in NAMI? Were they all peers? Uh, I think either they or have lived experience them? themselves or a family member has lived experience. And so they've kind of either seen it on the inside or they've really cared about the issues at hand. So yeah, most of them have some sort of a lived experience. And what kind of perspective did these NAMI folks that you were working with did they have regarding their medications and things like that? What was the general? Well, sort of for the yeah office vibe, well, we just all kind of <laughs> laid our cards on the table and um, and we just said whether we're pro or anti medication. No, I'm joking. We don't do that, man. Um, in the in our own voice program, which is where <laughs> we do public speaking presentations in like hospitals and churches and businesses and stuff, uh, the only thing they say about medication is not to mention specific ones. Uh, because people have different reactions to different medications. And so they say, you know, if one of them didn't mm -hmm. work for you and you say, oh, this is terrible, it might send the wrong message. Um, so that's kind of the extent to which right. they um, advocated for the topic of medications. But other than that, it was a one-on-one -on -one thing. There, re there really wasn't, you know, anything yet to sign that you agree with this about meds. And people just have differing opinions on them, probably based on how much it's helped or hindered their life. All right. So there was no mandate that you needed to embrace medication as part of your program or anything like that. You could just be there, participate. And they were paying you like right. this was a paid job. No, this wasn't a volunteer paid. job. Am I living the dream? Well, I'll tell you, I'm wow. surfing an American lucid dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're on the streets in, in San Diego and you're getting shaped by people. Tell us a story. Tell us about one guy, one one person that really, you know, yeah, there were a lot, man. Honestly, people who I could be deep friends with, maybe lifelong friends, obviously there's some kind of barriers for, for that kind of thing. But so many kind of soul connections. Uh, there was one guy who was in jail. And so like, he literally got a captive audience in jail, a captive audience. And so people are much more receptive. You're captive. Ca and captive. So they were receptive to hearing from me, having okay. visits from me. Um, you know, not everyone embraces this. Some people just shut you out. But this guy because I could kind of meet with him literally where he's at, um, I could hear his mind and his brilliance. He, mm -hmm. he had a master's degree in philosophy. Um, and so I would buy him books and I'd he'd just spend the time reading and we'd discuss the books. So we really built a relationship for months in jail so that when he was released, I was the guy that he trusted. And so, and that was the cool thing about IHOT, right? We had funds that we could hook people up with a hotel room for a night, um, trying to set them up with these longer lasting things that outlived us because we were a short-term program. And so I was able to do that sort of thing and, and connect him to things. And he later told me that if it wasn't for us coming alongside him and recognizing his value and the intelligence that he had and kind of walking alongside him, he might've taken his own life right there in jail. 
just because people are told you're a criminal. I'm, I'm not saying they're told. People absorb these identity forming images of I'm a criminal. I'm no good. My family sure. doesn't get me. Um, but when someone recognizes your value, you can say, oh, well, maybe I do have something to offer the world. And then he, he did really well. He was so kind of cooperative and connecting to all these different programs, got a job, um, was able to continue his education and even teach people as well. Um, so that was just one of many, many kind of life transforming stories. Okay, so this was all shaping you. You're there, you're helping people. And then this is shaping your understanding of things. It seemed to bring you to a better place. How, how do you think you move personally from where you were prior to your first episode until um, you started doing your program? Yeah. Well, how, how did you shift? I think because I was kind of adopting just what I was told in high school. Like, oh, the reality is like this. I don't know. We're random atoms bumping up against each other. There's no real purpose. I was like, are you serious? So, and I thought, you know, there's the corporate world. You've got to climb some sort of a ladder. Start your climb, bro. And, and then I got pushed off my ladder. The whole thing crashed. And I was like, wait a minute. If I'm going to put this thing back up, which wall do I want to lean it up against so that I'm stoked when I get to the top? Um, so I didn't exactly know, but as I started taking this journey, it just started like manifesting itself in front of me, these little breadcrumbs that I would follow until the path just unraveled itself. So I'm getting more and more evidence that there's a larger intelligence force behind the world and that is, you know, kind of looking after us and is making reality magical again. And it's it's absolutely intriguing. I had no idea you could make money doing this kind of thing. I had no idea that these states of consciousness were legit and like so many of the spiritual saints and stuff tapped into them as well. And I feel like the West needs a bit of a reminder of our, of our roots. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And so it's personally made every day an adventure like this, man, the way that we're able to talk like this, like even the alignment of things, the way things are laid out, even on the drive down here, I've just got this kind of web in my mind that's constantly being enriched so that I have a, a deep meaning and purpose. And it makes me stoked to wake up every day pretty much stoked bro. stoked sounds good and, and that was another uh joseph campbell analogy right he said the uh a midlife crisis is when you've been climbing the ladder your ladder of ambition and then you get to the top of that ladder and realize your ladder's on the wrong wall All right so you gotta move it on move it over you know and i sort of went through the same thing you know although i my corporate ladder, I knew I was on the wrong steps, like the second rung. You know what I mean? It was like, this world, this advertising world is not really meant for me. But I couldn't see an alternative. I couldn't see another possibility, you know. And then I just had to sort of blow the whole thing up and be like, okay, well, there's no possibility. But I had I had tapped in, like from my hospitalization, tapped into sort of that, maybe the best way to describe it at this point is the quantum dimension yeah. of life. You know, because at least there's some scientific backing that there is a quantum dimension to reality. And, you know, it's it's where particles are more like waves. And and, and that's I think that's what we're tapping into. You know, there's no time, no space. We're all connected. Um, there's some there's some physics behind that. And so that's sort of my way to relate to it. I think you know? you're so right. And understanding that there is physics behind it. There's also anthropology and history and spiritual theology behind it. There's a lot of a lot behind it, um, but just for you having kind of left the rungs, um, it's hard for anyone, you know, when you've spent the time climbing the rungs, and then to think there's no alternative. Yeah, we're doing that because what else are we going to do? But when you you are pushed off the ladder or whatever happens, and you discover, oh wait, there's some other kind of interconnectivity, um, it can open up all sorts of pathways. And I mean, you know, we wouldn't have met each other if you hadn't have jumped off that second rung. And you wouldn't have had the influence in the world. I mean, maybe you would have blown up as a marketer or whatever, but you, you might not have had the influence in the world you've had now um, if you hadn't have stepped off that ladder. So I do think that there's a, a quantum entanglement yeah. and meaning and purpose behind a lot of what happens. I might have been doing those Super, time, super Bowl halftime shows, though. You never know. I mean, that could have... Rolling in dough, man, but maybe not. No, I'm, so I'm money quite... not exactly buy that. <laughs> I think I would have been extremely successful and extremely miserable and probably divorced four times. Yeah. You know, one of those guys. Wow. So we're certainly on the same page and, and, you know, even a couple, it still gets me though. You know, I still, I still fall into the trap because a few weeks ago, my schedule just went dead, you know, like nothing. I had three clients drop in the same week. 
And it was, I was just so bummed out for a couple of days, right? But then I started to see the links to my infancy, took it to therapy, realized that some of these feelings had very deep roots, started working through them. And, you know, the last two weeks has actually been pretty cool, you know? We're doing this, and a guy uh, from a city nearby invited us to come and see his social program. And he's like running a building donated by the Catholic Church, 20-room facility helping kids that are um, have, have been um, exposed to severe violence and things like this. And he wants to bring us in. He wants to bring my wife and I in and run some programs there and He's got a house next door. He wants to turn into a sort of Soteria kind of place. And I was like, this is awesome. This is everything I'm looking for close to home, you know? So that things went quantum pretty quickly. They did. And, and in two weeks, I mean, two weeks ago, you couldn't have kind of predicted some of these things. It's like, you never know what's going to emerge. And it's so cool though, that you're like tracing the roots. No. You were able to go explore these things. Okay. What is this? Is there some sort yeah. of a lesson or healing that needs to happen? And maybe we do circle the same mountain until we've kind of got the lesson as the Israelites did. And then you, we can move on. Um, yeah, I'm still going through those circles and still, you know, working on stuff from ancient history, you know, from right. my own Be stuff. Order. Yeah. Okay. So you're in Nami. You make this wild video where you mentioned me. That video you made is... Um, to promote, is it to promote your program? No, so that's the NR and voice presentation. So like I started doing those uh, back in like 2018, as soon as I graduated seminary. So it's a public speaking program. And so I kind of presented that story mm -hmm. before the NAMI leaders and the managers of that program, and they were stoked. And so I've been telling that story, a very similar version for years. And then now with COVID, NAMI has obviously mm -hmm. gravitated more towards the digital domain. And um, we were like, okay, let's publish this in video format. And so now it's on the YouTube channel. So it's basically the same story that I've been telling for quite some time. But it's no, it's not to promote anything. It's just it's to tell my story. Oh, and okay. it's um, in three phases. It's like what happened, what helps, and what's next. And so I kind of go through some of these things. And just to know that other people have been through it and can come out with post-traumatic growth. Things can be better on the other side than they ever were before. It can be hugely encouraging to people. So I love public speaking. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, and I'm Thanks. sure you're great at it. And so one of the things you mentioned in this video, which which was quite interesting, and Chris Cole has brought it up in the past, was neurodiversity. Uh, what is it that you teach about neurodiversity in your course? Like, how do you see neurodiversity, and what do you bring to the table with that yeah, for people? Neurodiversity I see as a kind of a subset of biodiversity that a, this intelligence that orchestrates the planet wants to preserve diversity because some people have different abilities than others. It's like if the world was made up of all Wall Street bankers, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't get far. And if it was made up of a bunch of hippies, we wouldn't either. And so neurodiversity is an intelligence that has made us the way we are for a reason. And so it stemmed from Judy Singer's work on the autism spectrum. Uh, and I do believe consciousness is a bit of a spectrum. I think a lot of things are. And that some of us just vibrate at different frequencies. But we can understand these things better if you combine the different frequencies of the rainbow. If you combine all the different colors, you get closer and closer to that one white light. And so neurodiversity is a framework building, you know, stepping on the shoulders and reaching off the work that's been done by the autism community, which was beautiful. Um, and it's to say, no, maybe there's actually some potential in these states of consciousness. And if we can reframe our identity that actually I was made with intelligence. And if you, if you tap into that rather than the broken brain model, for instance, that story that I was told, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then you are looking for, for th what things you can bring to the world and you, then you find them and then the world recognizes some of the, the opportunities that we have. Nice. And you, you went through one analogy there, which is pretty cool, but you went through it really quick. You know, the more colors you bring in, the closer to the white light Shocking. you get. You know, interesting. I've, I've never really thought of it that way, so... And so what's the program involved now? Like you're, you're doing an educational Yeah, it's program, a workshop. Right? Um, I don't really like the word workshop. Um, we've got to come up with something better. It's a, like a play shop, but we're really discovering these models of neurodiversity. It's like an interactive <laughs> sort of program that guides okay. people through activities and exercises and like, you know, psychological tests and stuff. So some of the, the tangible things, but also these theoretical frameworks that help us to chart models of neurodiversity. 
Um, so we explore alternative cultures, you know, you in Brazil, they have a different paradigm, different lens of seeing reality through. And if we can combine the different colors of world culture, which is why I believe cultures have been set up differently, we can fill the gaps in some of our understanding. So we take people on an excursion to some, some foreign paradigms of ways of viewing these states of neurodiversity, South Africa being one of them. Yeah. South Africa and Sangormas. And then we okay. take people through ancient Greece and the philosophy that people have been thinking about these kinds of things for millennia. And they had wisdom back then. We, we don't need to think that in our modern age, we, this is the pinnacle of kind of understanding that's chronocentrism. So transcend culturocentrism, transcend chronocentrism. Um, learn about depth psychology that we have here in the West because we do have a lot of awesome thinkers and rich perspectives here in the West. Explore some of that and then combine it with insights from some of the spiritual masters. How have they navigated these states of neurodiversity? And are there any lessons we can take that can give us these maps in how to navigate it? For instance, um, Jesus, like when he was first filled with the Holy Spirit after his baptism with John, he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tested, to develop this, this ability of discernment, which is what I think we all need. And so, firstly, he was told, mm -hmm. hey, you can satisfy your physical needs by just manifesting with your mind. Turn these, these rocks into bread. And he was like, Oh, but the, the wisdom tradition, the, the kind of cultures that have come before me and the written text says you shouldn't live on bread alone. Pass that test. He didn't do it. Then he was encouraged to jump off the temple and fly. Hey, you could you could probably fly. And I thought the same thing. I mean, people on LSD um, think the same thing that you can fly. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of presence that was trying to coax him into jumping off the temple. Um, I mean, how many Jesuses have jumped off and then, we never found out what their potential was, but he passed that test again by saying, well, but it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And then the third one was, Hey, you've got these abilities, man. Imagine you could rule the world with us. Imagine what you could do. Just bow down to me and serve, serve me these kind of temptations of grandiosity. And he was like, wait a minute. No, he was only supposed to serve God. And at that point, angels came and, and ministered to him. He passed all three tests. But I failed them. I was given all of those tests, like manifesting stuff with your mind, trying to fly <laughs> and using this power of this being a lucid dream to kind of control stuff. And so if I had have known, I mean, I knew the story, but I didn't know how that related to these conditions of neurodiversity. If I had have known that it's a similar kind of spiritual terrain that we have to navigate with wisdom, I, I probably would have navigated it better. So that's the kind of final component is... Um, is these spiritual understandings and then bringing it back to the modern world, kind of the hero's journey. Awesome. Awesome. Have you come across a book, uh, Evelyn Underhill uh, mysticism by Evelyn yeah, Underhill yeah, Christian for that book? Huh? Yeah. I mean, I was underlining every, every second paragraph. I was like, yeah, this sounds like a manic episode. Sounds like a manic episode. This is what people go through in a manic episode. There's no difference between what the saints, sages, and what people in the psychiatric hospital are going through. It's all the same stuff. You, you see, know, so if, if we could stuff. teach people how to navigate this, we'd set free a generation of prophets, man. Like all the insight and respect and wisdom that came through them uh, could channel through people like us if we could do this well. I would hope so. I would hope so. As I, as I said at a transpersonal conference once, my first time, I said, I think we're going through the, a massive spiritual awakening here, here, and we're just fucking it up completely, you know, <laughs> because we're just using this old paradigm of the psychiatric paradigm and all these spiritual experiences. They don't mean anything in that paradigm, you know, but you've got to and you've got to go back and you've got to go back to tribal interpretations or, or esoteric religious interpretations, mystics, inter interpretations of the mystics. Christian saints, monks, their experiences. And all through history, you see these kind of experiences and people come out of them and, and they go on to do great things sometimes. Yeah, it's so true. I, the old paradigm, I guess um, like Hegel's model, the German philosopher Hegel was pretty cool. There's like a thesis, then an antithesis, mm -hmm. and then there's a syn synthesis. Or he also has this model about how um, mm -hmm. the old has to break apart for the new to emerge. So the first phase of anything whether it's world religions or even Pangaea, the continent is a simplified unity. It's just a primitive monism. But then there's a splitting apart. Oh, there's this divergence um, and the continents break apart. Uh, there's a split between humans and God. But in the third phase, there's a differentiated unity, how these things come back together more well-informed. 
And so at the moment, we're trying to use an old paradigm to navigate new terrain. We can take kind of the gems from that paradigm and put them to use in this new one. And I think you're right. Something new is emerging. I mean, it's it's pretty well documented, actually, that we're in the midst of a spiritual renaissance. And I think the psychedelic renaissance is a part of that. We're craving the meaning and the purpose. And so it really is very exciting times, as I'm sure a lot of people know. But what are we going to do with it? We happen to be born in this time for such a time as this. We were born. And it reminds me just an off of something in the side. You know, we, I was talking about hip hop with uh, Keanu Fitzgerald in a previous interview. And I've been sort of out of the hip hop thing for a while because I live in Brazil. We don't get American hip hop down here. We get funk from Rio de Janeiro, which is a little bit different. Um, but I mean, I was listening to some lyrics from Kendrick Lamar the other day, and it was just like, it just stopped me in my tracks. It was coming from a whole different place. There was vulnerability there that I have never heard in hip hop ever. Cause you know, rap music has always been about, you know, power and ego and being strong and, you know, having power over the women and all that stuff, which I, which I often loved, you know, I, I'm a big fan of old school hip hop, but um, haven't been a fan of it for a big fan for a few years, but I'm 56, you know, I think there should be an age limit on hip hop, but his, his uh, his lyrics were just coming from this completely different place that I've never heard another rapper coming from. And I was like, maybe this is part of the awakening, you know? Because to me, a big step in awakening mm -hmm. is vulnerability. And if you've got a hip hop artist coming from a vulnerable place, mm -hmm. things are shifting. Things are really changing. Yeah, a really positive you know? sign because it's art. It's like, yeah. it's, if it's going to emerge in the collective, it unconscious it's going to emerge in all these different spheres and um, so like chris cole talked about that metaphor of when a pot boils you see a little bubble there little bubble there until the whole thing starts bubbling and you have one yeah. of the first bubbles and i do think that authenticity and that vulnerability the world's craving that the world's kind of over this you know suits and ties and this whole game of this pretense these personas these masks we have to wear and so if it's coming out in hip-hop that is awesome i'd love it if you could send me that song um, because I think that's what this next generation needs is just yeah. dropping the mask so the, the light can get in and kind of clean up any of the infections and we can actually see each other for the first time. I think to a certain degree, too, why Joe Rogan's podcast has been so successful is, I mean, Joe Rogan is not the most intelligent person on the planet, you know, not by a long shot. OK, but yeah. he's very real in his podcast. You know, he just he is who he is. He doesn't apologize for it. And uh, he's very curious. He's just so sincere in the way he goes about his thing, you know. Um, and to me, I think that's what's what's yeah. really needed. It's really needed. And, and it inspired me to do interviews, oh, actually. Cool. So, Yo, shout Joe, out to Joe Rogan. This, hello, bro. <laughs> <laughs> give, give, stop calling me, dude. I need some time to just breathe a little bit, Joe. Please stop. Yeah, but you're right, Sean. I think that's what the world is craving is All authenticity. Right. Uh, and Joe is able to combine that with a curiosity. The world is trying to all form its new maps, especially after COVID, about what on earth reality is. And so Joe is able to combine openness and authenticity with curiosity, which is what the world wants at the moment. So I'm glad you're doing these interviews. Um, I think this is all part of the movement that's happening. Yeah, I hope so. I saw one little clip where he had this uh, guy from India. You probably yeah. heard of him, Sad yeah. Guru. Yeah. Sad Guru? Yeah, okay. He's an Indian guru. And... Uh, who seems to be trying really hard to get famous. But this sad guru was talking about how the modern world has forgotten about heaven. And, the, and, and so they find themselves just lost in drug use and drugs and all this stuff. And Joe Rogan is just this huge advocate for psychedelics. He's got marijuana leaf on his logo and all that stuff. And his eyes are just like wide open in this interview. Like, okay, really? Oh, okay. That's interesting. Like, <laughs> But he's not fighting with the guy. He's just taking it in a completely different perspective than he's ever thought of. And who knows how this shapes Joe. But he stayed in the conversation with someone who has a perspective on mind-altering substances that are very different from his. You know? and I, I think we have to. That. If we're going to grow, we've got to expose ourselves to people who see things differently. Yeah. And I actually happen to think Sadhguru is right in that we all crave heaven. And I do believe that these substances can give us a little glimmer of heaven. Um, 
But I think we've got to be careful of sneaking into heaven through the back door. There's some shady characters in the alley who try to like trick you. There's propaganda in the spiritual world, just like there is here. And so that's why I, the 12 step program is trying to induce the state of spiritual awakening, this glimpse of heaven here. And it's been proven so effective to get people off substances. So I think people are, they're done with this, this version of purgatory or, or hell or whatever, and they're, they're craving the heaven more and more. So that's why the increase in the substance, but also the increase in other ways to get there and to be able to steer the rocket ship, which is what I'm hoping some of our work is doing. And especially with um, some of the vulnerable communities and there's funding for this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, there's probably not as much funding towards spiritual exploration as there is towards helping with the mental health crisis. So I think it's a prime position where we are right now. Mm. So you think that's sort of like the next step is for them to sort of start funding things related to understanding this, this, these disorders from a spiritual perspective, transpersonal perspective. Well, I think so. I mean, I think that that's just the next evolutionary step is like a shift in consciousness. It's like we could go back to the cavemen and th maybe they're pulling around a little buggy on two wheels. We're like, no, bro, put that aside. I've got one with four wheels for you. All right, cool. And like a carriage you can ride in. That's nice. But <laughs> what would really help them is expanding their consciousness so they understand kind of thermodynamics and how these things can be transmuted. So really, I think the evolution happens in consciousness. Um, it's going to be a, a consciousness paradigm shift. In fact, w um, one of the deans of Fuller said he thinks in our lifetime, we're going to see a paradigm shift related to in the same scale as what the Galilean revolution was. Wait, everything's the other way around. And he thinks it's going to happen in, in the realm of consciousness. And who better to explore that than those of us on the frontiers of consciousness? And that's, you know, people having near-death experiences people in the psychedelic states of consciousness, the spiritual masters or the mental health community who were really riding those frontiers. And so if, if it's going to be funded, if we're going to fund kind of this next level in what we are, the understanding of the world, what better place to put it than into mental health? Plus it alleviates the suffering and imbibes people with deep meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess, when it comes to the sort of awakening, the bubbling that's happening and you're talking about it, I'm a little bit, I don't know what the word, maybe a little, I don't know if jaded is the right word, but here is my problem. On the one hand, when I was making all my videos, 2007 to 2010, and I, I was quitting work to make videos, you know, <laughs> I left my wife to pay the bills. And um, I thought really something was going to happen around 2012. I was I was full on in on the Mayan calendar thing. I don't know if I thought the Mayans were onto something, but I was just like had this 2012 vision. And then when 2012 came around, it was one of the dullest years of my life. Like nothing happened. I was super frustrated. And it was just like, oh man, this sucks. And then 2013, I went out and started doing retreats, you know. But I, I got to confess, I mean, when I even look at the work I'm doing, distance healing work, stuff like that blows my mind. I had no idea I'd be doing anything like that. And like the 18 year old that I was, you know, back in 1984 or something like that, he looks at me and he just can't even believe we're the same person. You know, it's like, we're, I mean, I, I, the only explanation for how I got from there to here is parallel universes. I think I've been just sort of jumping through a fair, few parallel universes every once in a while that, that have led to this sort of awakened or increasingly awakened space. I know I've got more awakening to do, but just the fact that we can have this conversation the way we're doing, I think speaks to an awakening happening, something unfolding. I think you're so right. And it, it's yeah. really hard, you know, when you're one of the first to bubble up in the pot. And for you, it's really exciting. You know, you can quit the jobs. Um, but then you're like, where's the next bubble coming? Where's the next bubble coming? I mean, I would imagine that Vincent van Gogh felt the same thing when no one was buying his paintings. Oh, you were just a couple of centuries ahead of your time. Same thing with William Blake, man. Like no one really recognized his genius until now. Um, so I think that the parallel dimension thing, well, I'm glad that our timelines intersected, our dimensions intersected, but I do think you were laying some things down um, that now the bubbling uh, might start to be seen. And even like the reduction in the clients you were talking about, uh, that could be a steering in a different direction towards new opportunities. And so, yeah, it can be really hard to be ahead of the pack. It can be lonely ahead of the pack, um, but we got to have those kind of neurodivergent people in our midst because the pack needs a bit of different perspective.
<laughs> yeah, and you've got it for sure. You've got it for sure. And and I'll tell you, the one thing that got me through, I think, was just remembering and reminding myself that this is what I always wanted. I always wanted to be on the leading edge of something. And then I went out to conferences and I was like, uh, Leisure, like my wife, I'm like, we're miles ahead of everybody. I mean, they're, they're, we are the absolute bleeding edge of the whole thing. And this is what I always wanted. So when I go through these down periods and take shit from people or whatever, it's like, this is part of it. You know, this is part of the, the, the leading edge. And it's very validating to, you know, have you here and, and see how my work has led to what you're doing with NAMI. So for me, it's like if you're influenced by my work and then you're doing what you're doing at NAMI and you're changing how they're doing things, then that means I'm changing things yes, at NAMI. Dude. See what I mean? It's like you're working through, right. like it's going through. And then, of course, it's not even me. It's spirit, right? It's like healing fields coming through me. It's rippling through you. Then it goes through NAMI. And then boom, boom shakalaka. shakalaka. Now, <laughs> boom shakalaka. That what you said, right? It is. It's exactly <laughs> that. And there's this larger story that's trying to emerge. Um, and so it's different than we think it's going to be, though. You know, you expected it to go a certain way back in the day, and it took a, a slight, but everything's yeah. like that. If we expect things to go a certain way, we kind of shut out the way things are. Our, our brain's too small, this little three-pound lump of matter to comprehend the meaning of the, the universe. So we're always going to kind of misnavigate what it's going to look like in the future. Um, but if we trust that there is something emerging, we can kind of flow with it. Instead, I mean, even with Jesus, they expected him to look very different. So a lot of people didn't recognize him at the time. Um, so, yeah, if we don't try to conform reality to our sure. expectations, but uh, trust that it's got a better idea than we do, um, it turns life into an adventure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I was 18, I thought the people in the year 2022 would all be walking around in jumpsuits, like spacesuits, because everything from the year 2022 was people in these jumpsuits, these orange jumpsuits, right? <laughs> I'm kind of glad we avoided that future because everybody in orange jumpsuits would not have been- Not a orange, bro. Right? If, they, if they're like bright pink, <laughs> like hot pink, then maybe, but not orange, dude. All right. Um, so where are things, where are things going with you now? What's your next project? What's your next gig? I All don't right. know exactly where it's going to go and where it's heading. Um, so, but every day these, this path just keeps on traveling in front of me. And so I guess what I did was in, in February, I started my company inspired mind mental health. And so that's a start now. I like I'm learning about entrepreneurship, like how to navigate capitalism and all of that, which is a whole nother you know, interesting field to explore. And so I'm, taking an associate's degree in entrepreneurship just at a local community college. And it's teaching me a lot. So I'm doing all the kind of the legal aspects, some of the, the financing aspect and trying to piece together this, but I, I'm not the best at that at all. So that's why I think if the best minds come together and we can all synergize and we can kind of do this together, um, that's going to give this whole awakening the best chance at success. So anyone who wants to be in touch and has ideas about how that should go, please, I'm all ears. I'm the sponge and yeah, you could reach me at southafricanjosh.com or inspiredmindmentalhealth.com and they, they link to the same place. Anything else we, you think we should talk oh, about? I think it's been such a rich conversation. I think it's, it's perfect. Yeah, I think that can tie it off with a nice neat bow. You know just how much I appreciate you, man, and your work and thank you for having me on the podcast. I really just appreciate your audience as well and what's emerging amongst us. I got such a love for the collective and where we're heading, headed as a species. So appreciate you, man. <laughs> This is the first time I've ever heard somebody say I appreciate you when they're talking to me and I actually think that they appreciated oh, me. So thank you. I'm going to actually put my heart touched. closer to the screen. <laughs> no, really, right? My heart. <laughs> no, really, Sean. Thanks. Man. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you very much. We'll be sure to stay in touch and um, I'm sure we'll meet one day. I'm sure we'll meet one day San somewhere, Diego somehow. It's a good place. And Brazil, it's got my name written all over it. Man. I kind of love to come down and kick it with you guys. I think you're doing awesome stuff down there. And yeah. congrats on the whole um, you know, community that you've discovered and the potential to turn it into a Soteria house and all of that. You'd be a real valuable asset to that. Hey. We're going to see where that goes. But definitely it's being led by a higher power. There's no doubt wrong. about that.